Hello and welcome to Big Picture. I am Vishal Dahiya and today we're going to talk about India-China relations. Now, after the meeting between the foreign ministers of both the countries, both sides have agreed on a five-point approach to the ongoing situation on the line of actual control. So, we will try and understand what exactly is uh, the present situation uh, as far as uh, the line of actual control is concerned and also the kind of uh, five-point agenda from here onwards for both the countries as well as uh, try and do a reality check on the India-China relations. And for more on this, we're joined by a distinguished panel of guests. Let me first introduce them to you, beginning with the former Ambassador TCA Rangachari. We're also joined by Pramit Paul Chaudhary, a foreign affairs editor of Hindustan Times and uh, retired Bay General S.B. Astana. Uh, strategic expert. Let me begin with you, Pramit, first, and uh, let's uh, start by giving our viewers a lowdown on uh, that uh, all-important meeting between the foreign ministers of India and China on the sidelines of uh, SCO. Well, as you know, this is the f this is the highest level meeting that has now been held between India and China since the crisis broke out. Uh, it is also the first physical meeting, other than the military commanders' meetings at the border earlier on. So you had, a, if you wish, a particularly important level meeting, both in terms of the, the, the rank of the officials meeting, two foreign ministers, as well as they were actually being able to meet directly and behind closed doors, uh, where conversations could be, of course, a bit more uh, frank than previous online conversations were. Second, it's now the, the, this, these conversations have also taken place in a set of circumstances uh, one is that India has imposed considerable economic sanctions on China, not only in the digital space, but also in the trade area, and aligned ourselves much more closely with the technological standards and, and uh, of the United States and the West, all of these which will have long-term detrimental costs to China. Uh, and of course, there has been an enormous degree of military mobilization on both sides uh, of, of the border. Um, and you know, there are lots of reports about the number of thousands of troops that have been push, pushed forward. And finally, of course, we've now seen India, for example, move its military deployments forward right to the point of its claim line in the Spongorso area, as well as the high level heights of the Finger of Four area of um, uh, Pangong So. So in effect, India sent a message that we are prepared to escalate this further. Uh, we are not going to be accepting the status quo as the Chinese have been trying to communicate to us repeatedly that let's just accept that Galwan Valley incident is over and whatever is accomplished on the ground now should be allowed to remain. India said obviously this is not going to happen and we are prepared to escalate further. My understanding is at the foreign minister's meeting, India made it very clear uh, that we are prepared to take, we are prepared to cause considerably more damage to the bilateral relationship. Uh, unless China is prepared to consider genuine disengagement and there would be no de-escalation on the Indian side until that disengagement took place. Okay, okay. Mm -hmm. Ambassador Rangachari, I'd like to bring you in here and looks like, you know, uh, as far as this particular meeting is concerned, that is between the foreign ministers of uh, two nations, this was uh, at, uh, at, at one of the highest levels wherein both sides could uh, hear and understand each other. And the joint statement which has come out after the meeting clearly says that both sides have agreed that the current situation in the border areas is not in the interest of either side. And also, both have agreed to abide by all the existing agreements and protocols on, uh, uh, you know, the, the border disputes there. And and situation on, on uh, you know, LSE is one part of it. But if you look at... Uh, this particular situation vis a vis the overall India China relation gamut, uh, how would you, uh, you know, uh, uh, place the entire thing? <clears throat> well, first of all, on the positive side, the fact that the two ministers have agreed that the dialogue would continue is a very positive agreement because the alternative to continuing with the dialogue is to have continuing tensions along the LAC, possibly also leading to conflict, which I think from what you were just mentioning that, you know, this current situation is not to the advantage of either side, uh, being one of the principles, one of the five principles that has been stated. Uh, therefore, the fact that the dialogue will continue, and I presume it will continue both at the uh, military diplomatic level as well as at the political level, is a positive sign. Uh, as far as the broader question of bilateral relationship is concerned, 
I am afraid that the current Chinese actions dating back to March, April have in fact resulted in a setback to the relationship. And unless with the Chinese side restores status quo ante, I fear that all that has been achieved in the course of the last three decades plus since the visit of Rajiv Gandhi as Prime Minister to China is, is going to come into question. A number of agreements have been uh, been signed between the two sides and uh, this again has been stated that these agreements would be avoided. But the fact is that recent reports of, for example, firing, uh, the fact that the Chinese have moved forward and tried to unilaterally change the status quo in the LAC and in the border areas, these are actual violations of the existing agreements. So having committed these violations and then to say that they will abide by the agreements that have already been signed can only lead in one direction and that is to restore status quo ante. And if that does not happen and if it doesn't happen in the course of the near future, which means in the coming weeks, in that case, I'm afraid that setback will be uh, very, very, uh, very, it will be bad and I, I'm, I'm hesitant to use the word but I must use it, it could be severe. Okay, okay. That, that, that seems, uh, you know, very well placed in terms of uh, the intentions. And it's not only about the talk, but uh, the intention to act upon uh, those uh, principles which have been agreed upon between both the foreign ministers. General Astana, I'd like to bring you in here on the strategic aspect of the entire situation, because if you look at uh, the, uh, you know, line of actual control and the areas where the tension has brewed up between uh, both the sides, uh, Strategically, uh, looks like we, uh, as in India, is right now does have an, a strategic advantage. But uh, we're giving, uh, you know, by this, by these uh, talks and by this particular uh, joint statement, it is clear that uh, we are trying to give one more, uh, you know, chance to the amicable solution of resolving everything through dialogue. Uh, certainly, we are giving a chance to uh, China with a very clear-cut strategic message that we are ready to go to any extent. The fact that we did secure the Chushal Heights and we have also shown our resolve to be on top of Finger 4, uh, it very clearly indicates that yes, if required, we can take the offensive measures as well. The second point I want to mention is that as far as uh, if we leave aside the optics, the basic achievement which these talks have achieved is they have tried to stop a conflict or perhaps delay a conflict if it, it has to happen. But attempt is to stop a conflict. But notwithstanding that, the mistrust which the Chinese uh, have created, that stays. The fact is that so long they are sitting in Dapsang and so long they are sitting in finger four instead of behind finger eight, uh, there is no question that these uh, two things can go simultaneously. It can't be business as usual. Mm -hmm. This was also indicated in the statements which were given before the talk. Chinese were strategically thinking that having made an ingress into the areas where they were not supposed to be as per CBMs, they will try and fear freeze the situation and say, okay, we will talk. And therefore they were saying that let's look relationship beyond or sidelining the border issue. Whereas the response of India was very clear that these two issues cannot be separated. So this is the stand as it stands now. Now, as far as LAC is concerned and as far as the borders are concerned, let me also tell the viewers that this is going to be a tug of war situation, notwithstanding what has been discussed. Because both sides are now looking at probing actions and trying to occupy an unoccupied hill so that you don't run into the risk of war, but at the same time you improve your strategic, uh, strategic stroke tactical position. So if that be so, and Chinese have been doing it every night, so we are quite clear if they are doing it, certainly uh, India will not be now sitting quiet and certainly will respond appropriately as and when the actions to take place. Okay. So I think okay. it's going to be a long a uh, hall, we are prepared for winters, let it get extended to winters, we will rough it out, but certainly we will not give a strategic advantage or a tactical advantage to China. 
Okay, we are definitely, you know, in for a long haul out there, and we, we, we are very well prepared, uh, our defence forces per se. But Pramit, uh, how would you, uh, you know, uh, uh, put your views on this aspect that uh, the kind of disconnect which is there between the words spoken by the Chinese side and their actions on the ground, uh, this is the mismatch which is at uh, the centre of, of this entire situation right now. And as uh, and Mr Rangachari was saying, unless this gets corrected in the coming few weeks... Uh, situation might not uh, improve in terms of, uh, you know, the bilateral relation between both the nations. There's, look, the point with the Chinese in all negotiations, it's the what happens on the ground that matters. They don't take words very seriously. They don't even take treaties and agreements very seriously. It's for them, it's about a power situation. Uh, I think we, the government erred in the beginning uh, when the military commanders met and there was an, the Chinese... Uh, agreed to a disengagement strategy, which did take place in Galwan Valley and a few others, but not uh, in Debsang and not definitely in Pangong. Uh, but we made a public announcement, it was publicly announced by the Indian side that there was such an agreement. As in Doklam, we should have waited until there was actual movement on the ground with the Chinese. Once you made the announcement, the Chinese immediately stopped moving calculating that this had been, you had actually boxed yourself in a corner and then waited to see what would happen. And I presume this is going to be a similar situation now. We, then the pressure points have been increased now. Uh, the Chinese, in my, in, I think almost anybody who has dealt with the Chinese know that they are the ultimate players in realpolitik. They really don't care about agreements and treaties. So then these are irrelevant pieces of paper. Barack Obama, after wasting one entire term his first term trying to come to an understanding with the Chinese, for example, on things like the South China Sea. Uh, later on in an interview, was asked about the Chinese. He said, with the Chinese, I realized, and uh, it was unfortunately belatedly for him, that they will essentially keep pushing as hard as possible until they face resistance. And you can come to any agreements, terms, treaties, whatever you want with them. It's totally irrelevant. They will keep pushing whatever they feel like doing until the point they face actual serious resistance. And that's basically what we've come to now. And they've now faced the prospect of either more bloody confrontation in which soldiers are killed and they are not capable of taking casualties. Uh, they've been surprised at the degree of casualties they've taken. Uh, they've taken economic hits, uh, which right now may not matter too much, but in the long run will. Um, and they have concerns that the, the present window of opportunity they have in the international arena with a distracted America, a, a weakened uh, Japan, uh, and so on, and a subservient Russia may not be necessarily in place uh, later on, either next year or even, or even potentially by the end of this year. Okay, okay. Uh, and Mr. Rangachari, your views on, on that aspect, uh, as Pramit is pointing out, you know, the kind of disconnect... Uh, which is there between China's words and the actions out there and the way it plays out. Uh, ultimately, uh, you know, eventually we are neighbours, India and China, and we'll have to live with each other. But from your experience, how would you see the situation playing out from here onwards? We are strategically in a, in a very, uh, you know, a significant and advantageous position. But the other side will also have to respond equally in terms of uh, the promises they make and the action they take on the ground. Well, I think the Chinese have been trying for some considerable time now to try and acquire on the ground what they claim on the map as LAC. Now, as we all know, the LAC as drawn by the Indian side and the LAC as drawn by the Chinese side. And by the way, when we talk in terms of LAC, we must make a distinction between LAC and the border because the present LAC is itself the creation of a new reality which dates back to 1962. So that difference between the Chinese and the Indian LAC and the overlaps between one and the other line and the Chinese attempts to try and control all of the areas up to what they claim mm -hmm. is the root of the problem. Now, so long as we are able to do whatever, that is to say that either India concedes or China concedes, and we do that through a process of mutual agreement, that is one situation. Here what we are faced with is a unilateral action, the use of force, 
for that unilateral action to try and bring about a new reality on the ground. Now, so far over the last three decades plus, India and China have both operated on the understanding that while we develop our relationship in various areas, in so far as the boundary question is concerned, in so far as the LAC is concerned, this will be subject to continuing discussions and as and when we are able to come to any agreement, that would be the whatever final shape emerges will emerge from that. Until then, neither side would unilaterally try and bring about a change and certainly not by the use of force. Now, that is the understanding that has been now undermined by the Chinese action. We saw in 2013, 2014, 2017, that similar attempts that the Chinese made, status quo ante was in fact restored. Uh -huh. And as a result of that, we were able to take some new steps in our bilateral relationship. Now, if in this case also, status quo ante is restored, and as I said, it may take a few weeks, it may take a few months, after all, Sundar Umchu took several years. So if status quo ante is restored, then we have a situation where we could go back to developing our relationship across the board. But if that does not happen, and if the Chinese insist that they're going to stay put along their claim lines because they have occupied certain ground positions now, then, as I said earlier, it's going to be very difficult for India to cooperate with China to develop the relationship across the board. Okay. Janastana? Uh, In terms certainly. of the way forward from here, as, as Ambassador Rangachari is also saying, it will uh, become, uh, you know, untenable as the time passes uh, for specifically for India if uh, China does not change the way it acts on the ground. Uh, certainly, Chinese follow incremental encroachment strategy that move five steps without fighting, don't fight and just stop short of fighting. And thereafter, in case the opposition is too strong, take a step back and say, okay, all is done. In the bargain, you gain four steps. That's the strategy. They have also junked all kinds of agreements. So therefore, the trust on agreements is absolutely not there. Take the example of Tajikistan, a settled border, signed, settled, demarcated border. Now they have started taking new claims on that border. So this is the status of China as far as we are concerned. Coming on to the LAC and border, I would like to add on to what uh, the ambassador said. As far as border is concerned, we treat in Ladakh, Johnson Line as the border, generally the alignment along Johnson Line and along the rest, we talk of McMahon Line. China does not recognize any treaty which was signed between Tibet and British India. Mm -hmm. But it also uh, changes its stance when it suits it. So in Doklam, it, it, he went back to 1890 treaty uh, because it was suiting them, uh, because the place or the location of Gipmo Chin, he thought, could be pushed towards Indian side and it will suit him. So, the changing stance is another strategy of China. Now, considering all that, I totally agree with the ambassador that unless these actions are replicated on ground, unless we see the improvements on ground, unless we see that Chinese are doing anything which is verifiable by us, then only I think we could move ahead with the uh, improvement of relations. Otherwise, it's going to be a tug of war situation. Both sides trying to, because unilaterally, we will not let them change the LAC. Now, LAC, if you recall, in 1959, Jawan Lai had given a map to mm -hmm. Nehru. Mm -hmm. Nehru did not agree with it. And thereafter, this is called as 1960 line. We moved on to the forward policy. And subsequently, they came right up to Shiok, and now they say that uh, till Shiok, everything is theirs. And when they came on 1962, the warning given to the PLA was remove everything, uh, all the Indian posts, uh, where, uh, which they perceive as their uh, territory. So, but they couldn't do it uh, uh, totally. Uh, but that is what the LAC is all about. And our perception certainly is different than them and perception overlaps. Now, this area of Ladakh and Galwan actually when we sat down and a lot of talks, uh, this area was not part of the disputed pockets. Now, all of a sudden, they suddenly woke up one day to say that, no, in 1962, we walked up to Shiok River, also, therefore, everything is ours. So now, they have been shifting their claim lines. They have been shifting their claim lines with us. 
they have been shifting their claim lines with Tajikistan. They have been shifting their claim lines with Bhutan. And in Bhutan also, they are trying that if they can shift the claim lines, improve the width of the Chumbi Valley, so that they can get more troops in Chumbi Valley and be able to threaten Siliguri Corridor in a meaningful way. This is their game plan. So certainly, there is a point where we have to say enough is enough. And I think India is at a cusp of saying enough is enough. And therefore, uh, they will have to contest everything hereafter, what they claim and what they think that if uh, they want to change a ground position or uh, a situation on ground. Okay. Okay. There it is. Uh, let me bring in, uh, uh, you know, um, Pramit uh, once again for the concluding comments here. Pramit, uh, you know, as uh, both the general and uh, the investor is pointing out, uh, and you also said earlier that China looks like is in the habit of changing goalposts every time they set on a sort of a new target or, uh, uh, you know, new course of action. And uh, if you look at the global situation also, given the scenario, how would you believe uh, from here onwards this bilateral relation between these two, uh, you know, major nations and obviously neighbours as well is really, really significant, how it might develop from here onwards? I think it now no longer matters whether China does go back to its original positions on the LAC. Uh, a large portion of the economic relationship is now completely wiped out and will not be restored. You will not see the restoration of Chinese major Chinese apps, at least to Indian phones. We will see a deliberate attempt to slowly eradicate even the presence of Chinese electronics in our markets. Uh, the, the bans on Chinese investment or restrictions on Chinese investment and finance in Indian infrastructure, on government procurement, are going to stay. They will not be repealed no matter what happens uh, with the Chinese. Um, our continuing restrictions on Chinese, on whether Confucius Institutes or people-to-people -people exchange, some of those might be lifted. The softer things will might be reconsidered. Um, and I think, but the real fundamental question will be, and I think this will ultimately go in this direction, is how close do we wish to become geopolitically to the United States as the U.S.-China relationship deteriorates quite dramatically. And my sense would be that definitely on things like the Quad, um, the new supply chain policies, uh, the 5G technology alliance, we will see a deliberate and total shift towards the United States, irrespective of what happens with China on the border right now. Okay. Those are not being fundamentally finished. That, that, that cannot be reversed. Okay. Okay. And Mr. Rangachari, your, your uh, concluding comments on the entire gamut of bilateral relations between India and China, that includes the economic part as well, and uh, some points which were mentioned by Pramit also. Well, I think it's going to be very difficult for China to recover from this politically in the region and perhaps also at the global level. And I'm not speaking in terms of specifically either the economic relationship or any other kind of relationship. The point is that the Chinese have been trying to convey to the world that they are now number two in the world and therefore they can get away with doing whatever. If they are not able to succeed and if they are forced to come to some kind of an agreement with India, which really in terms of what we are looking for is status quo ante, then it does tremendous damage to China's prestige globally. For the rest, I hope that if the Chinese do restore status quo ante, the situation will not be as drastic. It may take a little time for India to uh, feel friendly again towards China, but I hope that will come about because given the size of China, given the size of India, given the fact that we are both Asian neighbours, given that we are such large populations, I think it is good for stability in this region, stability globally, that we should have normal relationship. And for that reason alone, it makes sense for China not to press ahead with trying to get a few square kilometers, a few tens of square kids of kilometers of territory, but instead look at the big picture, mm -hmm. look at the India-China relationship in the regional and global context and return to status quo ante. Okay.
Okay, there it is. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Rangachari, General Astana and Pramita for sharing your time and views with us and our viewers. So there it is, uh, the overall uh, reality check of India-China relations, factors affecting the bilateral relation between both the countries as well as the short-term and long-term ramifications. We'll keep a close watch on uh, the evolving situation and bring more details to you. Till then, keep watching Rajasipa Television.